So hi guys, welcome back to our last webinar, the fifth one. So now we're going to get to know more about Pulsar Helium, a company that owns the Topaz Helium project in Minnesota and the Chinook Helium project in Greenland. So to discuss the company, we, we are welcoming Thomas Abrams James, president and CEO of the company. So how are you doing? Yeah, uh, merci beaucoup, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, doing very well. Thank you. So it's my pleasure. And again, before we start, I'm going to remind you guys that you have the chat function. Uh, if you want to discuss the company or share your location, and if you have any questions that you, you prepare or you feel like asking during uh, the presentation, use the Q&A function and we go through them after the presentation. So now I'm going to turn my camera off and hand it over to you to start the presentation. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. So uh, Pulsar Helium, as the name suggests, it's all about helium, helium exploration and development. Uh, now that you've all had a chance to read the disclaimer, let's get into it. So our, uh, our Topaz project in Minnesota in the USA, this is the one that I'll be focusing on mostly today. And so what we have here is uh, get straight into the thick of it. It's a, it's a chart here of uh, basically the, 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 the top helium intercepts in North America uh, throughout history. And so Minnesota, the project that we have, the Topaz project, 13.8% helium content in the raw gas uh, makes it the number one in North America. Uh, to put that into perspective, um, anything which has got a raw gas content of 0.3% helium or greater is deemed to be of potential economic significance. So this really does put it up in the, well, it's number one in the charts for North America. And it's also worth uh, mentioning that the USA is the world's number one consumer of helium as well. So the right concentration in the right jurisdiction. Uh, so corporate structure. So with this one, we are a young company in terms of being listed. Um, so we did an IPO. Uh, important to mention that an IPO, so fresh clean listing on the TSXV in August last year, August the 15th. And uh, as far as I'm aware, we were out of any sector, we were the only IPO to occur on the TSXV up to that moment in time. So either we were doing something well or it was uh, a rough time for the TSXV, which uh, I think is not limited to just Canada, but a difficult time in the financial markets globally. So when we listed, uh, we had uh, a share price of 30 cents. Uh, we've now stabilized at roughly that uh, $1.20 mark. And uh, we had a, an all time high of uh, $1.60. And that really came off the back of the drill program that we conducted uh, at our Topaz project in Minnesota. Uh, market cap is 120-ish million Canadian. And uh, it's probably worth mentioning with the, the capital structure of the company. So we're very tightly held. So we have a majority of the ownership is via uh, directors and management. Uh, so we own about 48% of the company. Uh, our single largest shareholder, AB Crescent, uh, the Netherlands, uh, they've got uh, 15%. And then the, the, the public shareholding float is 38%. So with myself, with my fellow directors and managers, uh, that 48%, we are not completely unlocked uh, from escrow until three years after the IPO. So that's got two and a third years left to, to run, or two and a quarter, should I say. So um, so the, the actual mobile stock is, is, is quite limited. Uh, we also had uh, the uh, warrants that were out there. And um, the warrants from the IPOs, so there were 10 million of those, or 10 million and change. Uh, they, they had an exercise price of 45 cents. And uh, we put the accelerator on those uh, the other month and 100% uh, of those warrants were converted and we got approximately 5 million cash from that as well. So in a good position financially. Board and management, um, this one I think is important. Helium is a very new industry. Uh, it, it is a, a decade old. Uh, so doing dedicated helium exploration. Most of the helium at the moment is a byproduct of natural gas. It is not what we look for. We look for primary helium, where helium is the economic driver, primary economic driver. Uh, myself and Neil Herbert, our chairman, uh, we started up the world's first ever helium exploration company. It's a company called Helium One Global Limited, listed in London. 
we wrote the playbook effectively on helium. So firstly, my background is geology. So the first thing was, okay, what constitutes a primary helium system? What, what is the Goldilocks zone? What geological ingredients do you need? Now, at that time, I was living in Tanzania, and certainly Tanzania had those ingredients. And then we, uh, we then applied it globally. Uh, we found that uh, North America, primarily Minnesota, ticked the box of having the right ingredients. But the problem was it's quite vast. Where does one start? And uh, so I'll get into detail how we actually got into Minnesota a bit later. Uh, but really with that, so we created the playbook for exploration. Uh, we also uh, received the first dedicated investment for helium exploration. How do you then present this to a, a, uh, an, a potential investor? Uh, industrial gas is, is you know, historically something that nobody would invest in because it's, you know, quite frankly, it bores you to tears. But with helium, it's very different, that segment within the industrial gases. Um, its applications for technology and so on. So we, we, we uh, started that uh, in terms of meeting every walk of life that uses helium, uh, the ones who would be distributing it and so on. So that decade's worth of experience, myself, Neil, and also our technical manager, Josh Blewett, um, really have that experience. And I think probably other noteworthy people here that I'll embellish upon. So John Ferrier, uh, he's the former CEO of Gulf Keystone Petroleum. Uh, so that is a uh, petroleum producer out of Iraq uh, after the last Gulf War uh, has turned that one into production. And then Brees Laurent uh, is the representative of our largest shareholder with a financial background. Um, so advantages really for us. We What makes us different, I won't read this slide, but what makes us different from other helium companies is we don't go to areas where uh, it's been drilled before, it's been produced before, and there's uh, you know a little bit of helium that's in, in the assays, in, in, in the uh, uh, concentration of gas, and then put a license around it. That's not what we do. The geology dictates where we go. We look for new areas which have all the potential to be primary helium uh, uh, you know, producers that has uh, that has that uh, you know lack of any previous work with all the potential in the world in terms of the size and, uh, and really not dictated by hydrocarbons. So we let the geology lead us rather than historic results. Um, so that certainly with our project in in Minnesota, we're the first mover there, and uh, with our project in Greenland, we're the first mover there as well. Uh, so all the potential in the world. Uh, why helium in terms of pricing? So it's yeah, roughly a decade ago, probably more. So here it's 24 years ago, you really start to see that the price was going up. And, and that was on the back of uh, a lack of output from the United States, uh, the world's number one producer of helium, but also the, the Federal Helium Reserve, which is the only standalone helium uh, reserve in the world, dwindling. Uh, so realizing that it's coming to the end of its life. And in fact, this year it was uh, sold, it was privatized uh, with a little bit of helium that remains. So the only flywheel in the system has now disappeared and the majority of helium production now is on the back of uh, hydrocarbon production as a byproduct. The red dot represents uh, a recent pricing point for gas helium, so, so $625 per thousand cubic feet. And then the blue one represents liquid helium, which is the, certainly the value add at $1,100 per thousand cubic feet. Uh, natural gas is approximately four to $5 for the same unit. This particular slide here, so the, the, the market, I don't really like this slide, to be honest, um, because uh, demand is curtailed by supply. It's really the only commodity that I can think of that for the past decade, people who want to have the product pay for the product and cannot get the product uh, consistently. And those are typically the ones lower down the food chain. So this is uh, hospitals and research. Uh, they're the ones that don't have the buying power compared to the big tech companies, and they have been rationed with their supply consistently for the past decade. Um, so the issue is USA supplies in decline, and this is mostly due to aging gas fields. Uh, so, so they're just getting old, so their the production rates are lower. And so that's created a gap in the market, and Qatar in the Middle East is filling that gap. Problem with the Qatar is, is that uh, transportation, getting that to North America, is uh, problematic. Helium doesn't like to be transported uh, over you know, a prolonged period of time. Uh, if it's in a container for more than 25 days, then chances are you'll start to get some loss of product. Certainly coming across from the Middle East to North America uh, with the um, geopolitical issues and the extended shipping route, we're now seeing that uh, there's consistent loss of product. 
And then the other one is Russia, and we're not going to be seeing any Russian helium supply uh, to North America for the foreseeable future. The uses. I like getting party balloons out of the way. Party balloons is about 3% of market share and a frivolous waste of a very valuable and non-renewable commodity. Everything else is tech, tech, tech. So semiconductors is a big one. So computer chips. In order to make them, you need liquid helium. Uh, MRI scanners for the magnet to superconduct, you need liquid helium. Uh, I was actually at CERN uh, last week at the Large Hadron Collider, single largest user of helium, and uh, basically a, a one huge uh, MRI scanner. Very impressive. Uh, fiber optic cable manufacturing, liquid helium. Uh, helium reactors, the, the, the new stage of uh, nuclear uh, reactors, use helium, computer hard drives, you name it. So really, uh, we can only see demand for product increasing uh, due to our reliance on tech. Uh, so here we are. So this is our portfolio. So Topaz in Minnesota and Tunu in Greenland. Today, I will be emphasizing our project in Minnesota only because it is more advanced. Um, but I will touch briefly on uh, Greenland. Now, Topaz is in northern Minnesota, Lake County, just north of Duluth, regional capital. And uh, really, its backbone there is the resource industry. So taconite mining, and then also, so taconite being iron ore, uh, but then also they've got uh, nickel and copper uh, deposits there as well. Um, so with our project here, news flow. Well, probably the single biggest one recently is new legislation. Um, so this is only, what, 10 days ago. Uh, that the state of Minnesota put in place new legislation, which really gives us the framework to move forward and to get into production, knowing what the rules of engagement are and uh, and what to abide by. Uh, without those in place, we would be dealing with this uh, with the county, uh, but now we're dealing with the state. And it's uh, I must admit, I'm just so impressed with uh, how quickly they've moved to get that legislation in place, and uh, the support that they've given this new industry. So that uh, that legislation is relevant for helium, hydrogen, and CO2 sequestration. Uh, so it uh, doesn't uh, really hit on hydrocarbons. Uh, consolidation. So for us as the first mover, it's all been about consolidating our position in terms of land ownership. Uh, so to start off with, it was private mineral rights that we were able to obtain. Uh, and then with the uh, state now passing legislation, we can get the state mineral rights. We have an application with them. Uh, and then there's federal mineral rights, but the federal rights are, are not for lease. And uh, so we cannot get those. Nobody can get those. And um, so we are very confident that we have now consolidated our, our position uh, in all the areas of interest in Minnesota. Uh, appraisal well. So this one, I can see the, the questions coming in thick and fast. I know exactly what you want me to answer and believe me, I'll get there. Uh, but we drilled the uh, appraisal well in February and uh, now we are doing the flow and pressure testing. And I will talk more about that in just a moment. And uh, then the resource reserve calculation, which is what will come after we receive the results from the flow and pressure tests. So we'll then have a resource update, which we anticipate should be completed sometime next month. Location, 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 northern Minnesota. Here we are. Uh, we are right next to uh, North America's largest iron ore mines, uh, all the highly skilled labor that comes with it and the infrastructure that you would expect. Roads, electricity, access to Lake Superior, uh, it's all there. It's worth mentioning that with, uh, with helium production, the only consumable that you have is electricity. And so there are uh, electrical, there's grid power nearby, and that power comes majority from hydroelectricity. Uh, and then the road network really would be looking at domestic supply. And uh, so to get really to the furthest point of the contiguous United States would take two days. So we don't have to worry about loss of product. Also, it's worth mentioning, too, that Minnesota has actually got quite a lot in terms of uh, semiconductor manufacturing and helium distribution. So and then the Mayo Clinic as well for, uh, for helium for medical uses. So there's actually quite a few uh, major users of helium very close within a couple of hours of where we are. Uh, the discovery of helium. So how did we come to know about this? So this is all the way back in 2011. A company was present drilling for nickel. Uh, unsuccessful, but what they did do is at uh, 542 meters depth, they hit gas. And uh, I can only imagine it must have been terrifying because the gas was really roaring out of the ground. Uh, it blew uh, 2.8 meters worth of drill core out of the ground uh, through the drill string like a projectile. And of course, they were concerned that it was going to be combustible, that this was going to uh, catch on fire and blow up the rig. Uh, a brave geologist there, uh, 
took the ass samples, uh, so six of them in total, sent them off to two different laboratories. Both came back saying non-combustible, but extremely high helium content of 10.5%, both the labs uh, agreeing with each other. This really then prompted us to look elsewhere in Minnesota. Is this an isolated occurrence? Is it just a pocket or is it something larger? And we found that uh, 160 kilometers to the southwest, there was 2% helium that was recorded there. Now, these are the only two uh, gas indications that there's multiple gas occurrences in Minnesota, but only two of them were ever analyzed for helium, one 10.5% and the other one 2%, both of which are just world-class grade. Uh, the other gases to come with are CO2, nitrogen, and then helium being the third. Um, the USA has a CO2 shortage, so we uh, have uh, no lack of interest in CO2 as well in terms of monetizing that. Uh, originally, we were looking to re-inject that, but now the uh, the shortage and the the value of that product, uh, so CO2 being priced more than natural gas at the moment, seems to be very viable that uh, that we could monetize that as well. So here's the appraisal well. Uh, so this is what we drilled in February. So this rig is now left site. We drilled slightly deeper than uh, the original discovery, which is only 20 meters off uh, to the to the northwest. And uh, what we found is that the gas there. We, we're getting elevations of up to 13.8% helium. So it's nice to replicate and indeed approve upon the original result. And uh, so then with the flow testing pressure buildup program, so that is now uh, currently underway. Yes, it has taken a little bit uh, longer than anticipated, uh, not due to uh, any uh, conditions or any problems with the hole. Uh, it's that's, uh, really it's been an operational delay, which I can only apologize for. Uh, but with those results, we anticipate those certainly coming out very, very soon. So there is not long to wait. I uh, was hoping that uh, this particular presentation, I could uh, tell you the results, but uh, alas, uh, it is not quite ready yet. So imminently uh, to be watched this space, shall I say. But we're off to a tremendous start with that, uh, that concentration of helium uh, being the highest in North America. And uh, based on the previous well result, uh, the original discovery where the gas was flowing out there, that certainly has given us a, a certain level of confidence. Uh, what we've also done is we've conducted uh, seismic surveys. So we use uh, what's called passive seismic or ambient noise tomography. This is where you don't need to clear lines. You don't need to use explosives or thumper trucks. You simply leave uh, sensors um, on the surface uh, for a period of time, three to four weeks. And they record uh, seismic waves that are induced by either the, the iron ore mine that's just off to our west or by lightning bolts or by trains or vehicles. And over time, they record all that data. So low impact, uh, but very high resolution data. And it's come up with this, uh, this, this section that we see here. So in red, we've got a drill trace. And we can see that at the bottom of the drill trace, trace you just intersect this green zone. And that's where we hit the gas. This green zone is our area of interest. And basically what it represents is where the velocity uh, of the seismic waves uh, decreases, it slows down. And so, so we anticipate that this is our area of interest. This is the, uh, the, the likely helium reservoir. And uh, we can see in the next image, now this is looking top down in plan view. It's open to the north, it's open to the west, and it's open to the south. We do not think that we're looking at something isolated. We think we're looking at quite a large system. Um, so that's Greenland. Uh, now we're going to, yeah, so now we're on to Greenland. So our project here, Itokitormit, uh, is the settlement that's just nearby to us, like a postcard, a wonderful place. Uh, but I've been working in Greenland uh, previously for about five years. It's a place I know very well. And what we did here is that we had a, uh, a geological theory that this area would have the potential for primary helium. Uh, we tested that in 2022, and it was proven correct. Uh, that indeed there is uh, mobile helium that's here and not associated with hydrocarbons. Now, the concentration of helium is less at 0.8%, uh, but in Canada, uh, there are producers there with 0.4 to 0.5%. So it's certainly, you know, compared to our project in Greenland, uh, it, it, sorry, compared to the project in Minnesota, the concentration is less. However, the European Union doesn't really have any domestic supply of helium, and it is on the critical list there. So, uh, So this is yeah, I think deemed very much of interest. We'll be doing a, a field program there this year, uh, doing a seismic survey with the anticipation of perhaps being drill ready next year. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, so there's geothermal energy potential here. So there's, there's areas where there's, there's uh, you know, no, no ice, no snow melt. Uh, there's a very high temperature gradient at depth. And so what we're looking at is the possibility of uh, coincidental 
uh, helium production and geothermal energy production as well. And we're speaking to the European Union to see if there are any possibilities for that uh, drill program to potentially be funded by grants uh, rather than using our capital. Um, with the first mover in Greenland and the license area is vast, it's 2,816 square kilometers. Um, how do we know that there's helium there? Hot springs. In this particular location, you get these hot springs, uh, so they get up to 60 degrees Celsius. And uh, with those, you have bubbles coming up from depth. You capture the bubbles, which is what uh, you know my colleagues here are doing. So this is Dr. Peter Barry from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. The bubbles come up, you gather them in the tube, you collect a sample and send it off to a laboratory, and that's representative of what's happening at depth. Um, ESG commitment, yeah, we're certainly committed to that. I mean, we have a real opportunity here. More than 95% of the world's helium is produced as a byproduct of hydrocarbons. What we are looking at is helium that is not associated with hydrocarbons. Uh, so we have a number of initiatives uh, involved uh, with that to support like-minded initiatives. Uh, so we give out scholars, uh, so bursaries to uh, university students. Uh, we also have every month uh, a different uh, experience uh, showcasing the uses of helium in different industries. And then this one, really, this is the, the last one that I'll, I'll leave with, with the roadmap to success. So really, how do you go to develop a helium project? Uh, it is much like, uh, much like most mineral commodities. Firstly, you identify your area of interest. Uh, you then uh, obtain a, a lease, like you would for you know, standard minerals. Uh, data acquisition, and this is where our Greenland project is at this phase. So we, we've got the samples, we know the helium's there and all the historic data and the geophysics. Next on, you go on and you build up a resource. And so this would be uh, a prospective resource, which is the sort of the lowest confidence one saying, okay, what is the area of interest? You then go up and start drilling. This is where we're at with the Topaz phase, a Topaz project. So we have uh, drilled the exploratory well, which is the original discovery. And the appraisal well is what we drilled this year. After that, so for Topaz, we're looking at uh, next month uh, that we would have the recalculate the resource. And then after that, should it all look positive, then we'd certainly be starting to then look at the economic scenarios. We'd be looking at uh, offtake agreements. Uh, we'd then be looking at uh, a feasibility study for the economics and then eventually get into, uh, you know, should all the, the planets align and all look well, uh, then looking at production. For production of helium, uh, to have, say, really the prize is liquid helium. Uh, that is the most value add one. And uh, for a, a helium plant, you're, you're probably looking at, you know, should we be looking at something quite large? You're probably looking at a, a capital cost of about 50 million US for that. So certainly compared to a lot of other commodities, the, um, the, the, the cost is significantly less than a lot of mining operations. And uh, as is the footprint as well, I mean, really, for having such high helium concentration as uh, as we have in Minnesota, then potentially the, the number of uh, producing wells required to feed into a uh, production facility uh, may be, well be less uh, than those who have got lower concentration helium. And look, it really concludes the formal part of my uh, presentation. So Mark, uh, I hope I've done well for time. And uh, if there are any questions, I am more than happy to answer. Well, thanks a lot for this in-depth presentation. It was very informative. And as we were talking, we got lots of technical questions coming up. So mm -hmm. I was reading them and I was like, damn, it's going to be like very interesting. <laughs> uh, can I see them here? Is that right? So Q&A. Should oh, I just go through them? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I would like, like to introduce some anyways. But okay, uh, just, just in Snelling, I actually ask a bunch of them. and. I'm pretty sure it's gonna enlighten everybody around. So it was asking about the flow rates from the three 12 hours flow test, the gas analysis is from this flow test and how did the composition change during these over 36 hours of flow? We haven't announced those results yet. So I'm afraid that it's uh, to be continued, but uh, we're anticipating uh, getting all that data very soon. Okay, so let's move forward then. Let's move on. Um, he's also asking if we can expect a sprawl evaluation report as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so once we get all that flow data, the pressure data and the downhole laboratory results, which, are, as I say, uh, we, we're anticipating seeing very soon, 
Uh, all that will be fed to Sprawl, who's our resource calculator. Uh, with all the data that we've received to, thus far, uh, Sprawl already has that. So they're now just waiting for these last bits. And uh, we anticipate that uh, it, sometime in July, we'll, we'll have their resource uh, you know, update and calculation. Thank you. So we have another question uh, asking if, if is there a reason why uh, investors have not been given any of the gas analysis breakdowns from all the other samples taken at the Jetstream 1 website? Yeah, for the same reason that I haven't received them either. So, uh, so yeah, <laughs> we haven't received them. <laughs> so it's a, uh, I, I, I'd just like to say a clarifying statement that we're 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 not withholding information here. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's 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 simply a matter uh, of having it all, and then we will definitely disclose it to the market. Uh, so yeah, no, there's nothing to feel there. Thank you. Uh, another question saying. And asking if uh, would there be any petrol physical report uh, be made available on any new websites presentation, and also asking if there could be any images uh, like image log slides, lithology. Yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's a good request actually. Yeah, and look as as far as I see, I don't see why not. Um, uh, in in fact, and you know some of those images and so on are quite uh, quite spectacular. So yeah, why not? Uh, I will recommend it to my team that they do that. Okay, so it, it was like all the most technical questions like at the moment. So now let's go in the more general ones. Um, Keith Goldsmith is asking, what's the biggest driver for uh, Gemini 4 Helium? And if you see any changing in the future? The biggest driver uh, for Helium uh, really is uh, increasing tech applications. So it, it's not something that can be uh, substituted. And uh, the reason I say that is that it's it's still a liquid at close to absolute zero, so one degree Kelvin. Uh, nothing else can do that, and it's also inert. Uh, so, so the more that we need to cool things, so you know, with processing power, with uh, with superconducting magnets and so on, it's uh, the, the necessity for helium increases. And really, what we see is that people aren't using really alternatives to it, but what they're doing is they're not actually proceeding with their technology because they can't get access to helium. Uh, so I can only see it increasing. And in terms of challenges, I mean, are there gonna be any you know new major disruptions? Uh, I mean, the price is very high now. Is it gonna stay like that forever? You know, history tells us probably not, but uh, what I take comfort in is that, uh, you know, having such high helium content is that, uh, you know, really in, a production scenario the higher the helium content the less gas that you need to process and so therefore one would hope that we would be a, a potential low-cost producer that could weather those price fluctuations in terms of any new potential sources i mean my old stomping ground in tanzania the guys are developing that uh but i guess with that one is it's quite displaced from the market uh, i'd say get it from africa across the, the usa or to uh, to asia is you know that's a challenge so, um, but otherwise, we, we know about the Qatari supply, we know about the Russian supply, and the, the really, the rest you could sort of do a bit of a calculation uh, about how much they've got, because as I say, they've gone into these older gas fields, and so you've already got a good feel about how much potential that they have. So I don't think they're gonna really change the supply uh, fundamentals. Thank you. So there's another question coming up. Uh, that actually came it's pretty early in the presentation but i feel like it's it's like pretty good to remember it um so the question is who who are some of the largest producers of helium today yeah okay so the largest ones uh, so in the usa the the single largest operation is on mobile uh shoot creek uh, so they produce helium and co2 from that operation uh the the federal helium reserve in the usa is dwindled down in size but it's still got you know a bit of gas there uh, that's owned by a private company called Mesa. Uh, you've then got, uh, you know, a bit of a haphazard, I guess, sort of uh, a production from multiple different natural gas projects. But probably the big one now is uh, the single largest producer is Qatar Gas in Qatar. Um, so that's on the back of their uh, natural gas production. And then Gazprom in Russia. Uh, those would be the biggest ones. So they're big sort of household name energy companies. Thank you. So we have another, uh, a question about the jurisdiction. You know, when we hear about mining jurisdiction in the US, uh, it always brings up first, you know, Arizona, Nevada. 
So could you develop again like a little bit uh, the mining history in Minnesota there? Yeah, well, it's it's a uh, it's a bit of a shame that Minnesota doesn't get more recognition for it because uh, the iron ore mines there are significant. So the largest iron ore producer in North America. Uh, so they've got that history from about 150 years worth of production there. Uh, so that's probably the, the single largest one. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of work on nickel and copper uh, exploration development there. Um, so look, it, it does have a, a, a rich history of uh, resource extraction. Thank you. Uh, another question just came up uh, about financials. So it's on Barry, why not? Um, the question is, <laughs> Uh, is the royalty by the government government paid at 18 percent um is there any chances the government will upgrade the roads and pay to get power to the site <laughs> that's not a question for me i don't think uh, it's uh, or I mean, it, uh you know like <laughs> gets on it well look uh, i i don't know to be honest uh, like i i think that it's it's, it's it's really not something that we're we're factoring into that uh, uh into uh you know into any sort of scenarios uh, we're assuming that we'll be paying for everything. So if it comes, it would be a, a nice gift, but uh, we're, we're not relying on anything like that. Thank you. So we have another question. I feel like now it's pretty common to hear this one, but so there's you and there, there are competitors. What's making you different from those competitors? Um, I just have to emphasize what I said earlier, that we have a very different methodology. Uh, we are led by the science, by the geology, like uh, for lack of a better term, you know, we're sort of a company of geeks here. Um, we're very technically focused. And uh, that, uh, so for our projects in, in Minnesota and Greenland, we're the first mover there and we're led by the geology. Uh, it's, it's not an old hydrocarbon system. It is purely got potential for, for, for helium as the major economic driver. And uh, for that reason alone, no one else has been there because uh, helium really, apart from you know past 10 years nobody would look for helium but now it's 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 a new industry and so uh, we're the first mover in these whereas other helium companies which are, and you know I'm, I'm not belittling them but they've got a very different mindset which is to to go off and to 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 scour databases looking for holes that have been drilled elsewhere uh, that have been analyzed for helium and if they've got elevated contents then they put their licenses around those uh, so that's that's I, I guess that's a uh, you know with that you'd have the sort of rough idea of what the potential would be because they've been drilled out quite well but also you know a majority of those have already been seeing a history of extraction so in terms of flow rates and so on that uh, they, they may well be less than say uh, a virgin uh, reservoir so uh, we go for the new, all the potential in the world dedicated to primary helium, whereas the others go for the sort of older known and you know most likely got some association with hydrocarbons. So uh, two different mindsets. Thank you. And because this is a new opportunity, you know, new company, so new opportunities as well. Uh, is there anything you would like to leave up for investors? And I'm pretty sure it would be like our last question for uh, the webinar. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I just find it very exciting. Uh, I really do. It's, uh, you know, on a, on a personal basis uh, to be involved, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, a dream, to be honest, to be involved in, in a new industry, in a new commodity that is so high in demand. Uh, you know, I, I take a, a great deal of pride in, in the work that the team has accomplished in a very short time frame. Uh, I think that uh, we're going about it professionally. And uh, I also think that uh, really it's, um, you know, it's uh, the, when you, you're in new jurisdictions to where we are, uh, we've got some fantastic grades. Uh, I really do think that it's, uh, it, I, I can't really think of any other commodity actually that's quite as exciting to be honest, which is probably why I switched across to helium full time 10 years ago and never really looked back. Uh, I think that uh, with it, I mean, it's, it is a young industry. We've seen some uh, some uh, some uh, success and some failures out there, uh, but I, I really wouldn't let that cloud people's minds too much. Do your own research and have a good look. But to have the support of the government like we do, to have the the interest that we've had at a national level in in the U.S. and uh, and with uh, with the consistent news flow that we have to come out in in you know very short time frame. 
uh, I really think it's an exciting time to be involved. And so, uh, you know, so much so that, uh, you know, myself and my colleagues, we've uh, agreed to be have our shares locked up and not fully released for three years. Uh, so I don't really know how else I could emphasize that we're in this for the long term and we are truly believers in, in what we've got. Well, thanks a lot, Tomas. It was, again, like, well informative, well in-depth. And I'm pretty sure that our attendees didn't miss a single word of what you said. So <laughs> thanks a lot again for everything. All right, everybody and Mark, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. And to our attendees, so thanks again for everything, for being part of it. We really appreciate uh, all of you being here to get to know more about the companies. Don't hesitate to follow them on their social media or to reach out to them if you have any extra questions. Thanks again, and see you at the next Resource Mining and Exploration Conference.